Hello and welcome to another video about motorcycling or another motorcycling video and as you can see in this one I've called it some thoughts about EVs so to be clear from the beginning I'm not trying to sell you an EV I don't own an EV I don't have any arrangement commercial or otherwise with any company that makes sells or imports EVs uh, these are just my observations about the EV market and what's happening at the moment and they're based on some ideas that I've picked up from other YouTube channels and so uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is battery degradation and I'm going to include a link below to Ludicrous Feed's channel. Ludicrous Feed is a Asian gentleman who owns a 20, uh, sorry, owns a, a, a Tesla Model S 70, uh, which he bought in 2015. Apparently he does an annual report every year. This is the first year that I've seen it in 2024. So he's owned this vehicle for nine years now. When he bought it, it was second hand, it had 9,000 kilometres. I think he said 9,000 kilometres on it. And uh, I think it has now about 116,000. So he's put about 107,000 kilometres in nine years, which puts him around or just below the average of about 12 to 15,000 kilometres that most Australians drive every year. Um, in his annual report this year, he had a dongle of some sort, which he was able to plug into the uh, vehicle's computer system. And the Model S70D that he has, has a 71 kilowatt hour battery. Actually, 66.5 kilowatt hours of that is usable. The rest is just because of engineering, it's not usable, but it's classified as, you know, it's rated as a 71 kilowatt hour battery. Anyway, so 66.5 kilowatt hours is the actual usable amount of the battery. And so with this dongle he's plugged in, he's been given a, a whole bunch of reports and information about the vehicle. But one thing that he has been told is that the battery has degraded by 5.5% in nine years. Now, I don't know if that's a good figure. I don't know how it compares with other Teslas or other electric vehicles. I don't know if that's the, like, as I said, a good or bad figure, but 5.5%, if uh, as he says, when batteries get to below about 40%, around 45% is when people start to look at their long-term um, functionality and maybe thinking about the battery being so degraded it's no longer going to be any good, or it's no, no longer going to be fit for purpose. At that rate, if the degradation was linear, in other words, it was 5.5% every nine years, it would take something like 45 years for that battery to degrade to the 45%. Now, of course, that's influenced by how many kilometres he does, how he drives it, and what type of charger he uses. And as I said, I don't know if that's a good figure or a bad figure, but it seemed not an unreasonable figure that after f nine years of ownership and 116,000 kilometres, the vehicle had still had 95 or 94.5% of its used battery as usable. Um, if you were to tune in, flip over channels now and tune into John Cadogan at the Auto Expert, you could be forgiven for thinking that the auto, that the EV revolution is either stalled or dead. Certainly, in his view, and the sales figures seem to bear it out at the moment, sales of EVs have flatlined. They've reached about 10%. That is total EV, total EV sales, not any particular brand, but total EV sales have reached about 10% of the market. Of new, of new vehicle sales and in his view they're probably not going to get very far beyond that they might reach 12 or 13 percent but they're probably not going to get very far beyond 10 percent and in his view based on those sales figures Australians don't want EVs and they don't want to buy them now again if you were to flip channels and go over to the electric Viking and listen to Sam Evans he's just come back from China and he's been shown a host of EVs by brands that we've never heard of in Australia, as well as brands that we have heard of, but brands we haven't heard of, who are promising to bring their brands, their models, and um, variants of their models to Australia in the next year or so. Now, in his view, there is a latent, untapped demand for EVs. It's only a question of the right model at the right price, and demand will explode, and people will be queuing up to buy EVs, and it would seem that EVs suppliers will not be able to match demand. Now, those two views are clearly contradictory. In John Cadogan's view, 
Um, and I'm not I'm not saying I know which is the answer. I'm just putting a point of view, uh, just telling you the points of view. In John Cadogan's point of view, there are going to be parking lots full of EVs that people just don't want to buy and that cannot be sold. And the factories, as is evidenced by MG recently, will tell the importers and the dealers, just discount these vehicles and sell them. Uh, MG, as you recall, discounted the price of some of their models by $10,000 because they had this stock that was sitting in a parking lot. It was not selling. Uh, and the only way to sell vehicles is either advertise more or cut the price. They decided to cut the price and they sold the vehicles that they had. Of course, that devalues all the vehicles were bought the week before the price was cut, but that's just business and MG don't care about that because they've already got your money. The second-hand value uh, or resale value on uh, trade-in makes no difference to them. Um, but in their view, some money is better than no money. We're not going to pay to ship these cars back to China or to another right-hand drive market. They're in your market. Discount them and sell them. Uh, in Sam Evans' view of the world, the electric Vikings view of the world, oodles and oodles of people are going to be lining up to buy EVs when they get one at the right price and the right model, and the suppliers will not be able to keep up with the demand. Now, I don't know which one is right. My crystal ball isn't as good as theirs, and I guess we'll find out in the next year to 18 months which of them is right. Maybe neither of them are correct. Um, the things that have held back EVs from the beginning are still there. They are battery degradation, which I've mentioned. Uh, they are price. That is the price of the vehicle. And it's true that the price has come down, but no one wants to pay $58,000 or whatever it is these days for a Tesla. Um, but if the affordable price bracket appears to be somewhere between 35 k and 50 k uh, if there are manufacturers who can produce and are willing to market EVs in that price range, I suspect that more vehicles will be sold. So price is an issue. Range is an issue. It always has been and it always will be until somehow somebody magically or somehow creates an EV that can go for a thousand kilometres on a charge. Whether we're going to get to that or not, I don't know. It's true that Australia is a big country. It's true that there are long distances between major population centres, but people do not spend their day driving between those major population centres like Sydney and Melbourne or Brisbane and Sydney and so on. The average Australian drives less than 40 kilometres a day. That works out to about 12,000 kilometres a year. So um, in that circumstance, range is still an issue, yes, because when we get in our car and go on holidays, we want to drive for as many kilometres as we can to get to the place we're going on holidays, and we only want to stop for a quick fill up of food, a toilet break, and fill up the tank and go again. And you obviously cannot do that with an EV. So range is an issue, and until we get to five or six or seven hundred kilometre range in, your, in EVs, it will continue to be an issue. Batteries are getting better, cars are becoming more energy efficient, but we're not there yet. The other issue is charging. How many charges do we need? Well, it's a bit like a question of how long is a piece of string. Um, if, when you need a charger, there isn't one, there'll never be enough. And it's true that when you plan a road trip, when you go on a road trip with an EV, you've got a plan. You've got to look and find out, well, where are the charges? What do I do when I get down to a 20, about 20% 20 of battery? Is there a charging station nearby? Do I have the apps on my phone for it? Do I have the right cables in my car? Are the charges working? Can I pull up and plug in or is somebody already there and I've got to wait longer? And that's going to delay my trip a little bit longer. So charging is still an issue and probably will be for a while. Those are the macro issues to do with EVs. But if we bring EVs down to the micro level, that is down to the level of the household and the family, maybe some of those issues aren't as critical as we think they are. But before I get into that, a couple of observations. If you do not have off-street parking, then an EV is clearly not a vehicle for you at the moment. You cannot assume that there's going to be an EV, a charger on your corner or that you can go to, the go to the shopping mall or somewhere like that and plug in and charge your car up. If you have off do not have off-street parking, you simply cannot run extension cords out of your doors or windows or whatever and across the fence councils will rightly crack down on that because someone's going to fall over your cord and injure themselves and the council's going to be sued so they're going to crack down on that and um, if you do not have off street parking then an ev is not for you if you live in an apartment building or something that's married managed by a body corporate or something like that 
an EV may not be for you because there will be people who live in the complex with you that say, I don't want an electric vehicle in the garage because it might catch fire. And as um, thermal runaway is a problem, EV fires are a, are a problem. They're not a huge problem, not anywhere near as you, big as you'd be led to believe, but they are a problem. And when they do catch fire, they're a serious problem. There'll be people who live in your apartment block or the building that's managed by the body corporate who say, well, I don't have a car and I'm not paying body corporate fees to install a charger for somebody who, uh, who's got an electric vehicle. I don't have a car and I don't, I'm not paying for that. So an EV is probably not for you. But if you have off-street parking, in a, whether you own the house or you're renting it, either under a carport or a garage or something like that, an EV could be, could be an option for you. Most families, not all I accept, but most families in Australia are two-car families. There is the big family car that everybody piles in and goes off on holidays, and then there is what we used to call a little shopper for the missus. And we don't say that anymore, but it's the principle of a smaller car that a few people in the family can pile into to do the school run, uh, to take people to the gym, take people to the park and ride, maybe do some grocery shopping and so on. Um, I'm thinking about cars about the size of a Toyota Corolla. I'm not necessarily endorsing the Corolla. I'm just saying for context so you can see what I'm talking about, a vehicle about that size. Now, the Toyota Corolla, is if I'm correct, go for somewhere between about 35 and 42, 35k and 42k depending on which model you get and how much trim and extras you want to pay for. So if you're looking at a car that's about the size of a Toyota Corolla and you're willing to pay somewhere between 32 or 35 and maybe 45k, there are at the moment already on the market EVs in that range uh, price bracket and according to Sam Evans, there will be EVs from a host of Chinese manufacturers coming to the Australian market that will be in or close to that price bracket. Now, most of those vehicles, not all of them, but most of them, have a range of 350 kilometres or thereabouts, or perhaps even more. Now, if you consider that most, the average Australian drives about 40 kilometres a day, yes, I'm going to hear people who say, but I drive 100 kilometres a day, or I do this, or I do that. Yes, of course, there are people who drive far more than the average and there are people who drive far less. That's why it's an average. But if most people drive an average of less than 40 kilometres a day, then if you had a vehicle that had a range of 300 kilometres, you could probably drive that for eight or nine days and not need to plug it in. And then if you have off-street parking with a PowerPoint, plug your car into the PowerPoint in your garage, leave it overnight and it'll probably be fully charged. And you might say, well, but my electricity bill will go up. Yes, of course your electricity bill will go up, but the petrol bill, the electricity bill will go up by significantly less than what the petrol bill will go down because you're driving an EV rather than driving a petrol-driven Toyota Corolla or Hyundai i30 or something similar. Um, many of those small to medium-sized hatches and SUVs that are electric are five-seater vehicles. Uh, so they would be comfortably able to fit one or two or even three children who are on the way to school with their backpacks. Uh, it would be ideal for driving someone down to the park and ride. It would be ideal for going to do the shopping, do the gym and all that sort of stuff. Now, I'm not recommending a brand. And if you are considering an EV, then, of course, you have to, uh, over a, a petrol and a combustion engine vehicle, then, of course, do your own research determine which vehicle is for you, uh, look at the, your finances, speak to a financial advisor if necessary, don't make any decisions based on anything I've said here, but perhaps consider some of the points that I've raised here as being points worthy of consideration when you're thinking about which vehicle will I buy. Um, it is said, by the way, that um, if all of the vehicles on the Australian roads were removed tomorrow. All of the light passenger vehicles, that is the ones that you and I drive, but if they're all taken off the roads tomorrow and they were all replaced with EVs, then our emissions would be reduced by approximately 10%. Now, given that we probably need to reduce our emissions by 30 or 40% to meet the targets that the government has set and has signed up to, that 10% is not a big number. 
but it still is a start. One of the reasons that people say the EV revolution is stalled is that um, the fanboys, as they're referred to derogatorily or derisively referred to, have already bought their Teslas and they don't need to buy another one for a very long time. Uh, the few people who, uh, according to the EV critics, are naive fools who think that driving an EV is going to solve the environmental problems have bought these, and everybody else has looked around and thought, I don't want an EV, and I'm not going to buy one. It may be that people don't want the models that are available. Yes, it's true that 50% or thereabouts of our new vehicle sales are either utes, that is 4x4 utes, or large SUVs, and I've discussed this in a previous video where the manufacturers say well people buy these cars so that's what we make whereas the customers might say well that's all you make so that's what we buy we might prefer to buy something else if you made us something else but at the moment you don't um, and as I say the EV may be the ideal second car for your family still keep the bigger car as if you're a two-car family, so that when you want to go on holidays and when you want to go on a family trip, everyone can pile in. You can go a long way on the petrol engine. But if you're just doing the around-town commuting kinds of things, an EV may be the option. I don't know if the market is stalled. I don't know if John Cadogan's right or Sam Evans is right, or maybe neither of them are right. I guess the next year to 18 months will tell us. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you have a comment, please provide it, and I'll be happy to respond when I become aware of it. Thank you for watching.